Bitte. Got it. Right. Daniel Christian. Wow, I can't believe it's like uh, I don't know. It's it's pretty exciting when you read a book. Sometimes it's uh, it's like you get to interact with your um, you get to interact with the internet mm -hmm. in a way. It's like you you're talking to like you know someone on TV. You know, you're talking to Jon Snow on Game of Thrones, and he talks back to you. <laughs> That's cool. That's what it's like meeting you, talking to you right now. It's really cool. Because, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, you just, uh, you're adjacent and, you know, it, and your things come up. That's um, it. They, and I really want, I really want to consult for our lab on, on, on our long term project we're looking at that this kind of lands really square in your field of expertise. It's exciting. Yeah, I love uh, the on, the on the intentional community side. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I love the way that you, you you said like we play in the same ballpark um, uh, when when you reached out um, and I I've just been like this is this has been literally on my desk. Oops, well, you know which book it is. Your book, yeah, there we go. All right, that book, yeah, and that yeah. book. It's it's been on my desk and I've I've actually just dipped into conversations of yours because I keep at the moment in my life I have a pile of reading. That I, I can't get to because I have the joy of having a young daughter and a piece of land that I just planted a food forest on. Um, but yeah, for, for me it's 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 actually an honor to to meet you, like in 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 many ways, because um there's a lot that I talk about completely completely green behind my ears mm -hmm. um, that comes from a culture. That, that you're deeply connected with um, and uh, one culture that gives voice to that kind of way of being in the world and seeing the world. And so to some extent, I was also nervous in, in meeting you because I, I really deeply value your perspective on where I might be going off track or in a right. language. Well, you, you won't be you won't be nervous when you figure out that I'm not like this, like you know, amazing wisdom keeper and you know, representative of all the indigenous <laughs> people in Australia. And you know what I mean? I'm, I'm like a, I'm just a cheeky little boy, mm -hmm. um, pretty much in my culture, and um, you know, I'm kind of uh, fondly tolerated, and people mm -hmm. find me amusing. Yeah. So let's start from there, because <laughs> then there won't be any cringe. Lo factor. Lovely to meet you, brother. I don't have any cringe factor, but that's just from uh, about you. But that's only because of various psychoses that I carry, not not because of you are, uh, not because you're not an impressive dude. Now, I but I felt that in the same way, I've uh, you know, while I'm not, I'm not deeply, deeply across all your work. You know, I feel you out there, like, you know, when you throw out a fishing line and you feel when the fish is sniffing around and it goes there, that one. Yeah, I feel that. And uh, with your work and, you know, particular, I've, I've, I don't know, I've listened to maybe 20 podcasts, um, many of which we've overlapped on. Like, I think there's a couple of podcasts where we were, um spliced into into the one city. after the other yeah. so it was like you were on that one and then i was on the next one what do they call that subsequent uh, I can't, I can't, uh there's a word i've lost it but anyway we were we were like that so you know it's like we've been uh playing in the same playground pissing in the same pool um but at the same time at the same time like uh i think a lot of the communities that are interested in our work and that are you know, dipping into it and, you know, quite heavily, they're not really communities that we are of necessarily, but, you know, people, it's just, there are people there who like it and who mm, take what they need from it. You know, um, like, I feel like we're quite outside. Both of us were quite outside, you know, the sense-making heterodox, you know, game B, um, IDW, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, community. Um, but for those people who are interested, who have a vague interest in sort of separatism and, uh, you know, even like, uh, 
even communities that are interested in sort of white nationalism and 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 secession and uh, <laughs> creating a white ethno state in the United States, I believe, are looking at aspects of our work in ways that make me not entirely comfortable. Um, they're true. Because they're trying to figure out how do you make a community work? <laughs> how do you make a community work? You know, when it's not attached to, uh, you know, a federation of states or a large nation or, you know, when it's not under the umbrella of a, of a large, distant, centralised bureaucracy. How do you make that work and not kill each other? Mm. Uh, I think is what a lot of people are thinking right now. Um, even, even a lot of fascists and, and weirdos. Wow. And you've opened up a very, very large territory just now. As a can of worms, we got yeah. to tread lightly because that's half our audience there is, uh, yeah. is, is, is Nazis. So like, uh, we, we better be careful. Yeah, I mean, this is this is something that I first encountered um, here on Mallorca when I came to Mallorca 10, 12, 12 years ago, actually, trying to work on the bioregional scale of resilience building and, and starting a dialogue. How would we re-inhabit that place mm. and, and actually heal it and in the process heal ourselves and create a better world for our children and, and life as a whole? And I suddenly found myself in groups where we were agreeing on local food sovereignty, local water sovereignty, local energy sovereignty, um, going back to listening to the place, the, the, the understanding the past and the traditions of the place in order to let the place speak to you. All of that we were agreeing on. And that something needed to change, we, needed, we agreed on too. But suddenly there was this energy of some people just slipping into, like we, we all had at least two languages where everybody could understand. But one of them was the local language, Mayokin. Not everybody could understand it. And there's the sensitivity on the one hand saying, of course, of course people need to be able to speak that local language. But if you're in a group of people who want to work together, um, speak a language that everybody can, can exchange with. And then I began to realize that in that group, there's a small subsection, which ideally would have all foreigners and even the Spaniards off the island and become a sort of island in and of itself, um, forget the world out there. And, and, and this is, you're absolutely right. Like there, there are people in the AFD in Germany who will read my stuff and take All right. memes and appropriate those, misappropriate those memes. And it's, how, I mean, how do you work, work with yeah. that? that, that oh, but, but it's also just, um, I mean, it's, it's you know, there's this people who just want to figure out how to do a local, a local economy. There's people who want to figure out how to um, reinstate the commons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a that's a that's a that's a that's an unquestionable good, right? But they want to reinstate the commons within their compound, where they're buying a bunch of AR-15s and 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 landmines and you know planning to overthrow the guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's you you just never know. You know, and it's like, well, I mean, eh. You know, you could be, I mean, so you you could help people out with, you know, how do you, how do you design a food forest? Mm -hmm. Like being uh, responsive to the place where you are and the, the, the bioregion you're inhabiting uh, so that that food forest will be self-sustaining over deep time. You might have the secrets to that. And it's like, well, that's a good thing, right? Um, I mean. Yes. And, you know, is, is it a good thing if like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, if a bunch of Satan worshippers do it, or if a bunch of, you know, I don't know, green activists do it who are like extreme and want to blow up a bunch of bridges and and find the bottlenecks of the supply chains and and, and break them with, you know, explosives, etc. Um, you know, is it this mm, I, I guess I guess you've got to figure out where your um where your accountabilities lie. Where's the line in the sand? I guess if you're Tucker Carlson and you're delivering a diatribe about the great replacement that you know these colored people are replacing white people, et cetera. And then the following week, that exact same diatribe turns up in the manifesto of somebody who kills like 18 people in a mass shooting. Um, you're probably gonna, you know, 
there's you can see like there's a cause and effect relationship there where you're probably going mm, I mean, okay. this, but for me uh, this is yeah you go with that but if you're like help if you're talking about food forests and then like you know dr evil makes a food forest on the moon it's like well you know um but where do yeah, you problem say, blow where, someone else where where do you sit with that because i mean that is true with any seeding, you know seeding of ideas or, or or communication to a larger audience where you don't where it's diffused where you don't know where the ideas land um is it better not I to feel like i feel like this is this is this should be part of the third trimester of the conversation mm -hmm. and we've we've like to jump straight in yeah. um I always I don't know. <laughs> okay, I tell you what, if we don't share this yeah. with the world or with yeah. anyone else, then then we could jump in and, and, and right in here and see where we go. But maybe uh well, well, yeah, I mean we, we, maybe in case we want to share it with people, let, let's think uh, like we're locating you. And I was like, I wanted to ask you where you were located, but then also what your mother tongue is, you mm. know, which I assume is is German. But um, I don't know if I'm just being racist and assuming that. No, it's, um, it's 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 an interesting one in the sense that I, I grew up in Germany, but I also was privileged enough to spend a lot of time in the Mediterranean with my grandmother when my parents were working. And, and all right, so there's that. Yeah, and so so my soul and my conditioning in terms of fun time at holidays, being on the beach and being allowed what you allowed yeah. to do with Granny, um, comes from li living in the Mediterranean. Because right. so, I wanted to ask you if you were like the ginger kid in Spy Kids. Uh, no, no. I'm, I'm, you, have you ever seen Spy Kids? No, I haven't actually. So I okay, all right. So, I, so I don't you've watch. Got a, you've got a spy. One one is like a, a, a Latino mm -hmm. fella, and one is a, a gringa. Mm -hmm. These two spies, and they they meet and they get married and they have two kids. Mm -hmm. And one of the kids, the boy, who's in pretty much in every Rodriguez film uh, <laughs> that you'll find, including Machete. Um, yeah, he, he's like a, he's a little redhead kid, little redhead Spanish kid. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I, I wondered, I'm like, hang on, he's called Banwal. Is he German? Is he like the kid on Spy Kids? Uh, you know, where, where is he from? And like I knew, and, and when I when I clicked on the Zoom meeting, it's like, you know, in English, it just says meeting room. But in Spanish, it's like, you know, la sala de sin contramentos magníficos de las personas de las, you know what I mean? Like it's a, it's a big... It's a big phrase. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm like, ah, I know he's been hanging out in Mallorca. I know he's, he's making an alternative, com a uh, intentional community there. And he's a big part of that. And uh, he's studied alternative, um, I keep saying alternative, um, but intentional communities all around the world. And he knows how they fail and he knows how they might, may work. And that's what I need to find out about you. And um, I, mean, I need to put this idea to you. But yeah, I just wanted to locate you first and see where you were at, and you are there. Well, I'm I'm on Mallorca. That's true. Um, I'm that's where you are. I'm originally German. I have a, spent a long time, twelve years in Scotland, living in, in also for four years in Fintorn, mm. an eco village that has sixty years history there. Of course, yeah. Um, and and phenotypically, yeah, I'm the ginger guy who looks much more like a Scot. So people get terribly confused because I have this. But things things <laughs> things like a Latin. Yeah. X, I guess. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I am, and will always be um, a giri or forester on this island that I've chosen to grow roots in, and that my daughter was born on. And my wife is English, so so no matter where we go, we'll always be um, not fully fitting into mm. that kind of image of we are the people from here. Uh, I I believe we're all earthlings, and actually from seven years of age onwards, my my parents tell me. When on holiday people ask me where you're from, I I would say I ich bin ein Erdling, which is I'm an Earthling. Um, <laughs> ich bin ein, uh, maybe JFK should have said that. <laughs> ich bin ein Erdling. Look, um, yeah. <laughs> at, at the same time, you know, I I would lament if that were actually true, and we were all just this monocultural Earthling, because then it wouldn't throw up the miracles of messy diaspora. Well, I'm uh, all about such as yourself that yeah. that, that um. That like horrendous geopolitics uh, produces but, but imperialism it, over time. I'm 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 all for 
the biocultural uniqueness of place and enjoying that. And, and, and that's also partially why I, I chose this. But I think we're dancing around a really important issue here, which is- We are the, dancing. The, the, the current swing of the pendulum is towards this intentional, like in our little echo chamber bubble, um, is towards this intentional community and yeah. localism and build from the ground up and create these lifeboats in these difficult times. Mm. And simply not, not out of any kind of judgment, just because it some, somehow triggers me because it's out of my own experience that I was exactly, that, that, that's my language, but my mm. language that led me to go to the eco-villages, to live in Findhorn, and to see that, at least in the global north, with the privileged situation that we had, it's all true, and it's all a lie. It's, yes. it's really bizarre. It's, it's a privileged bunch of middle-class people telling each other we're all a community for 60 years, and then kicking out some people that have dedicated their entire life to this community on the notion yeah. of, well, the foundation is now a business, and we're in a crisis, and we're giving you a severance payment of a week for every month. Yeah, yeah. Word for us. And, off yeah i and, talked to i met them i talked to those finhorn people yeah and, and yeah yeah I, I i consulted with the like i gave them a consult on the the their crisis of uh you know when that arsonist went mm -hmm. got loose yeah. there and you know w where their problem lies and it's 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 in that privilege of um of not having ever having not ever having encountered violence you know, being being from a community and a hemisphere that's outsourced its violence for their entire life to mm. other places. Mm. And, you know, I, like I could ask them straight, have you ever been punched in the face? And, you know, I've got 50 year old people telling me, no, I've never really half a century and nobody's ever punched you in the face. Where have you been? I've got a scar on the you back know, of my neck. How? Yeah, I'm looking at, like, I know I can see your scars. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> where have you been? How do you think you're going to make a human community if you don't know how violence is going to fit into that? If you don't have a plan for the violence, if you don't have a plan for the conflict, if you don't have a plan for that, 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 bits, not, if you're that, building an intentional community based on an illusion that you've lived your whole life, that well, there's well, this somehow default peacefulness. I, if you I just you. get rid of the bad people. I, I hear you, and that I have to def defend the Findhorn from my lived experience. Um, the bizarre thing is that in their privilege, they've spent ages working with process-oriented psychology and world work and deep democracy work to hear the voice of the um voiceless to to bring the unspoken to the to the scene mm -hmm. to talk about this violence and you're also yes. absolutely right they haven't got and the have recovered a, an well, authentic peasant, peasantry too i must yeah, yeah. i must say and, well, that, and, and recovered a, a pretty decent thing. sort See, of but this medieval other, like commons a crofting it, kind of way yeah they've recovered that like i i don't know it, that's not the entirety of it but there was that one piece where it's like they did not ha ha know how to deal with this arsonist mm. and they didn't have a plan for when he might come back and visit them in the night. Mm. And they didn't have a plan for how do you deal with this like six months before, you know? And I'm like, if you can't punch on with this fellow out in the street, if somebody can't punch on and you can't get it out, then what do you have community that's going to last? You know, there has to be some kind of structured ritualized violence in your community that minimizes the damage and distributes it so that it's not held by one elite group or like pretend, you know, expelled from the community because we're all peaceful vegans or something that doesn't work. Yeah, but, but, Sorry, I said vegan, that would, that was a bit racist. No, no, was, uh, that's not for that. But, um, <laughs> not yeah. racist, but prejudice, you know what I mean? But the, the, um, but where are you on the, because like, I might be wrong, but what I learned partially is that, yes, it's all about community and it's, a, mm. it's not just community with other human beings, but community with the place and the important, yeah. it's not intentional selected community of, oh, I like you, you can be in. Like I always yeah. remember one of the real wise elders at Findhorn is a guy called Greg Gibson, Australian, who yeah. arrived, arrived there in like 
as number six or seven after the caddies got there. So like oh, long, long, long time ago. And, and he said to me once, he's like, Daniel, this is just so funny in this place. Everybody is basically somehow an anarchist because they were able to question their own comfortable middle-class lifestyles and say, don't want this, want something else, want intentional community, want to be in this place with my friends and live um, yep. the solution and not the problem. Um, yeah. Nice intention. But then they think they all can get on simply because they have a similar rough ballpark. Yeah, no, no. But they're all anarchy anarchists. is no bosses, but lots of rules. Exactly. That's what anarchy is. Yeah. And, More rules than you, <laughs> you might so, like. That's why, yeah. that's why a lot of potential anarchists become libertarians. But the, because, but um, the, it's easier. The, the thing that, that I learned being at Finhorn is that A, if you go that path of intentional community building, or we're building the super bioregion project here for blah, 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 um, but only for our little in-group, yeah, then you create so much energy that flows inward that if you don't pay attention from the beginning, how that actually diffuses into your context and the people that aren't so comfortable, the racists in the area, the neoliberal crazy, it's all about growth, don't you see your misguided people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of them. And, and you somehow need to have a conversation that is place sourced and place based with all of them. Um, and, and if you try to exclude them because it's easier to get there faster and then they will see, we've tried that for 40 years in the eco village movement. Yeah. Now there's lots of wonderful young energy that is trying to do the same shit again and is unable yeah. to learn from the elders who have pioneered all yeah. of this 40 years ago and have found it doesn't work. And that's, that's it. annoying. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You must embrace divergence. Yes. Divergence, yeah. diversity of opinion, everything else. However, you must not tolerate boundary violation, repeated boundary violation. Now, from what I heard about that arsonist at Findhorn is that he'd spent a year like quite egregiously violating boundaries. And of course he's gonna finish up burning the place to the freaking ground if no one's gonna pull him up on it, if no one's gonna hold him accountable, if he's not gonna get dragged out the front, <laughs> you know, to the center of town, 200 people standing around calling him out and he's got to put his body on the line to account for his actions. And then somebody else has got to step up ritually and accept the role and the ordeal of going through that with this man one-on-one. -on -one. You know, it's an ordeal where you work through that. And in the finish, you know, you both walk away, you hug, you figure out a balance, and it comes from that. And it's, it's, very, it's really important. Because otherwise, <laughs> that it, it will be a boil that will pop up somewhere yeah. else. Now you're speaking to that deeper wisdom of real restorative justice practice that we had in every culture, just as we're, we, we were indigenous, place-sourced, regenerative cultures everywhere. Otherwise, you and I wouldn't be here. And that's one of the big other misunderstandings that people out there often don't get, is that they think that regenerative cultures is some sort of ideal utopia we now need to build. We need mm -hmm. to go back to it in a new way. But, but also to just like staying with the Findhorn specific, um, the bizarre and sometimes also sad thing is that they really got 80% of the way with this. Like they have yeah. tried to work with this man. They didn't just yeah. take him out. They, they, they've gone through this whole process, but they didn't know. have the holding capacity as a community of those deeper practices to actually take it to its natural conclusion. Just as a little anecdote, he literally stuffed a rubber glove with straw and put it on his pillow like this before wow. he did what put he one did. Up. And, and he lit both things and walked into forest and turned himself in. So it's it's a it's a it's a kind of talking about process-oriented psychology. Mm -hmm. It's a voice in the field, somebody acting something out that was wanting to be expressed. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's absolutely unacceptable. Uh, they, they, yeah, they tried everything except pressing the reset button that's right between his eyes. You know, like, anyway, look, uh, we're spending too much time. 
<laughs> I'm on this. However, it's yeah, we're getting. I, I don't. I don't here. go by the the advice. Good, good I don't good. know much about Findhorn except for the few yeah. hours that I've spent with them online, and um, I, I was just absolutely enchanted but, and blown away with well, um, everything they're doing. And I think they're. I think they. You know, they're right up there. Uh, and, and quite famous around the world. I know, um, so there's like a, a friend of mine, Jim Rutt. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably met him, you know, on the Jim Rutt show, the game bees kind of side of thing. Um, and they're all obsessed with making proto bees, what they call intentional communities. And he's quite he's quite excited about Finn Horn uh, and also the, um, the Israeli um, side of things. Yeah. yeah, with the kibbutz and everything. Is so... Um, you know, they, and there's good data on the kibbutzes, which is worth having a look at as well. But also, um, really, but I'm really interested in seeing what's working in your place as well, and the, also what you've seen around the world and where you're at now with thinking, thinking about it. Well, thanks. The, 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 um, first of all, I'm not starting an intentional community on on Mallorca precisely because I've realised that I don't think that that is the pathway. Um, mm what I'm trying to live into and it's difficult because I'm sensing the dynamics of modern life and familyhood and stupid nuclear family models and all those kind of things mm. that I'm running into in my own skin now um, is, is living the, the intention of simply moving into a place and saying, okay, this is it. And these are my people, the people I live next to. I, if I cho chose my ideal people, it would just take longer to get to the point that we have to learn how to disagree and still live with each other. With these people, it might be faster. And so I, what I'm try, trying to do is live that, doing my bit on the piece of land we've taken custodianship of, mm -hmm. starting the conversation with my immediate neighbors of what might be coming and how getting to know each other and getting into the habit of collective decision-making and mutual support might actually serve as well. If, if only that we get the muscles going of how we disagree and how we overcome disagreement and how we move forward together, because what's coming might just invite us <laughs> the hard way to have to do that in the future. So it's a process of relations. Yeah. It, it doesn't, doesn't require an initial outlay <laughs> so much. It's a process of relations that anybody could do in Everywhere. any neighborhood, really. Exactly. Instead of only people who have the privilege of being able to lay down a hundred grand to um, exactly move to Costa Rica, to part of a, essentially start, a freaking timeshare or whatever. <laughs> yeah, to uh, you know live the dream for a minute. And 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 that's in the, in the same way I'm trying to within human possibilities affect the wider bioregional conversation of what is the future of this island or these islands, the Balearics, where, where, where I've chosen to grow my roots. And because of that, all of what we br briefly mentioned, like, that, that long resonance with the Mediterranean, I feel my soul is more Mediterranean than German. And it's always mm -hmm. been like that. And, feel that bros. and, and so um, I've seeded conversations here on the island that means that just as you're saying, they've been picked up like the, the president of the Balearic Islands is talking about how the reinvention of tourism in the Balearics has to be regenerative and we need to be leaders in regenerative tourism. Yes, I did give her my book, but I, there, there's, it's empty what she's saying because she hasn't actually read the book, but she's and, and, and memes are being picked up. But behind the scenes, I'm also weaving different marine and terrestrial restoration and protection and um, conservation bodies into an understanding that there is nothing to restore read, um, or, or preserve or conserve because we've already kicked climate change into action. The whole thing is in flow and flux. Mm -hmm. And we have to actively become regenerators and, and, and restorers of each place yeah. But not with a conservative. In 1950, we did a baseline study, and this was the ecosystem, <laughs> pristine. And now we need to get back to that ecosystem. And every external species is not allowed; it's invasive. There's so much rigidity, even among people who are wanting to be of service and doing the right thing. And so I've been weaving them into 
a conversation around, the, they call it the pre-alliance because they don't agree with each other enough to call it an alliance yet. Um, but, but it's a pre-alliance around the concept of creating an area under regeneration that includes the sea and the land and starts a conversation of people in place of saying, how, how would we create a more resilient, diverse community and local economy in the process of making both the land and the sea more abundant, healthier, and more, more productive in that sense, bioproductive, but not for harvest, but for, for in and of itself, for, for the healing process. And yeah, that's a, I can only start these conversations. I can weave people together. Very quickly, there's a demand and they're looking at me and I'm actually having to carefully extract myself from that process because they need to have that conversation. I can be one of the people having that conversation, but not the leader of that conversation. And, and how do I do that? Which is by and large pro bono, because it's kind of homeopathic over time, over 12 yeah. years. Well, and um, who has oversight of the entire exactly like the entirety it, 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 of the picture? Who knows? Who, who, who has the quantum computer in their brain that can see the entire thing? I mean, I can't. I mean, we have land and sea, land and sea management, uh, you know, uh, policies and programs in place. You know, on my country, mm -hmm. you know, when I fly back uh, next Wednesday for funeral, uh, back up home, it's, you know, I'll be performing pretty much the only role that I get to play in that right now, which is, I mean, I'll get to eat some turtle and dugong um, at the funeral feast. I'll join in with that and... You know, and that's and that's pretty much at the moment. That's all I can do, because you know, at the moment, you know, since COVID, all all I've been able to get home for is is funerals, and disasters and things like that. And so, you know, um, I don't get time for hunting. Um, I get to like you know maybe three days a year. I might get to throw a line in and catch a couple of fish, and remember what that's like. But that's about as far as I get at the moment. Because I was stupid enough to write a book, Daniel. <laughs> so now all I can do is talk about, talk to people about where my thinking was at three years ago uh, in Zoom meetings uh, in, instead of being where I was supposed to be. Yeah, it's awesome. But it's, it, it is important because we, I, I have managed, out of that, I have managed to start up the Indigenous Knowledge Systems Lab at Deakin Uni. And we do have a, um, a project going that I'm, I'm pretty keen to run past you at, at some stage as we progress through this uh, through this yarn, because uh, I think you might have some uh, pretty unique insights uh, for us. And, and you know. yeah, yeah, because you. you've studied you studied all like intentional communities around the world, you know, over time, you know, since the '70s, um, you know where they've fallen apart and. I mean, do you have some some good heuristics that you can sort of chunk all the uh, the do's and don'ts into? Or uh, I can see that you're not really mad on mad keen on that, which is good because I'm not either. Yeah, I'm not like I'm. I kind of let go of academia um, a few years ago, but partially because they they have these requests and then they and then they ask invite you to write papers and and and, and yeah. watch jumping through hoops that like I'd rather just write it and have people read it rather than write it and then have it hidden in an academic journal that nobody reads. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I I mean again what like I hear you so much on the being off country, um, not being where your your roots are and. For me, for me, okay, I'm not where my where orig uh, I'm originally from, but I am trying to come back to place. And and the, the same dynamic that I mean, I, I overheard you sharing with Carol that you only really wanted to buy a new car because you needed one because the old one had broken down, and that's why you banged out the book. As uh, um, well, it's pretty damn good for that. Um, it's, it's in terms yeah, yeah. of resonance it, it created and people and the conversation it started uh, because it. People still want to talk to you three years later or many years later about what you meant. But for me, it's the same thing. It's like, yes, somehow that all serves, maybe. But as you pointed out at the very beginning, it all serves, also gets used by people that we might not 
actively want to serve in terms of their intentions for the world and like ultra right wing fascist racists um and i'm like i because i've been ill for the last six weeks which is a weird thing for me it's to do with my daughter being in school for the first year and everybody tells right. me normal but I've, I've never experienced having three flus back to back. It feels like the COVID conspiracy theorists could even go, mm -hmm. it's just normal. It happens to everybody, but it feels weird. And so I'm also in a bit of a state, like I'm not, like my, my take might be a little bit different than it would be if I'm or Genki Deska, as the Japanese like to say. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Isn't it time, like if we look at the world and where the world is at, maybe we all need to find our places, but not in the sense that I, I sense is in that energy of the game beers and the proto bees, like, oh, if we just build it and they will come and then it will transform the area and it will transform everything. Yeah? The same with the regen villages that, oh, let's build a regen village and make it an eco village, but, but with, Teslas and and um, Skynet connection or whatever they yeah. all the, the yeah. stuff yeah. and and even like the way that solar punk is now so much more sexy than having a conversation about rehabilitation yeah um, and the <laughs> solar punk is more sexy than a conversation about <laughs> rehabilitation that's, that's awesome that's a great soundbite <laughs> and. They are hard to talk to, these solar punks. They're fun. They're fun to talk to. It's just... It's Pro just uh, probably because we're too old and not using the right right mediums, like because yeah. you're trying to do it on a Zoom call or via email or any of those. Like, you yeah, yeah. have to have some other recently <laughs> invented gadget to communicate. <laughs> um, I think yeah. we must. we might be a similar age. Are you around 50? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, same. So we're both exes. Yeah. Digital yeah. immigrants, definitely. And 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 yeah, problem. digital immigrants, but like you're not, you know, with no meaningful link to the I don't know, the 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 past of the the sort of occupying oligarchies, etc. And I'm just kind of you know, a bit adrift. Uh economically speaking, anyway. Yeah. How I completely, this is a curveball question, but how, having had the privilege, even if it is like as the average to just participating in your uh, mm. culture, as you were, were pointing out, how is being in touch with technologies of the sacred that have worked for a hundred thousand mm. years, making mm. you look at our culture's obsession with this pissy little thing we call technology and are so fucking proud of that we have millionaires, billionaires is escaping to the skies and being celebrated for it rather than ridiculed for it. Thanks for asking that in that way, that technologies of the sacred, you know, because it's not like, you know, Stone Age or Paleolithic, you know, technologies or underdeveloped or, I don't know, the, the red or blue, I can't remember what color part of the integral developmental model <laughs> or whatever i don't know the baseline of like you know when things were crappy um yeah it's 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 true like sacred technology the sacred technologies like the the psycho technologies but everything else yeah just just being in better with that but also being privileged enough to to be inducted into deep enough parts of that to be able to see the sort of meta framework of it and the the reason for it and the way it works and the um you know the how and the why of that deep time design process you know and why it's important um yeah it's how it is is it's lovely but it's it's it just it's really frustrating it's difficult. It's difficult to have to go into the world and talk to people who are driven, who are, you know, capable of understanding what you're talking about, but absolutely 
locked in for their livelihoods into faster, bigger, better. Mm. You know, so all like the only people who can understand the way I'm translating these things are people who are also Web3 enthusiasts and <laughs> do you know what I mean? Mm. And, 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 and crypto fascists and, and you know, uh, DeFi gurus. You know, it's all these kinds of people and I'm making friends there and and they're really good people and I'm enjoying their company. You know, but at the same time, I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated because, you know, in the end, where it ends is faster, bigger, better uh, unto death. And that's it. But I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that was a question that I was thinking that would be interesting to talk about, which is your current reading of that clearly that world of faster, bigger, better. Mm. Within collapse, has been in collapse for a long time. The warning, like we were on the 50th, both of us are 50 and we're on the 50th anniversary of um, limits to growth. And that was a limited, but very yeah. prophetic um, warning in the language that could have been understood at the time because it was the people's language. It wasn't like, it was scientific fact, blah, blah, blah. And, and when, and even what I find interesting, I haven't actually talked talk to Jim Rutt about this yet, is that recently I found out through a guy called Michael McDonald, a medical doctor who works on kind of deep prep for um, wealthy bioregions. Um, he was involved with Jonas Sark, who invented the polio vaccine. And after that, had all the funding available he wanted. He was at MIT. And he decided to put it towards saving humanity, that kind of mm -hmm. And this is like the late 1980s. And they talked about the S curve. They talked about getting off the exponential growth curve and into the logistics curve. And they called it that the whole study Epoch B. And Epoch B. Epoch B. And um, they concluded at the end of the, like in the 80s, that if by the mid-1990s we had not made fundamental course corrections around the operating system we were using, like the, the whole card house, um, billions would die. And, and I still find it really like, and yes, of course, we haven't made that correction, but I still, when I hear friends that I appreciate, like Joe Brewer's work in in, in um, Colombia, there's a lot of the intention and a lot of what he's pulling together and the platform he's building where I think this wonderful work. And still this kind of, wow, well, yeah, you're in the denial. Like, like, I've heard this meme from a number of people now. Well, it's really deeply sad and it saddens me a lot that billions will die without waking up to this. I find that really hard to say that that sentence. I find that like there's something that is like, did you just hear what you said? Like I can't really say that sentence without then deeply questioning who I am and my complicitness in all of this. And then like somehow I can scientifically understand the prediction, but I can't emotionally say a sentence like that. Mm. Just to sound more clever and analytical and um, mm. how, how well do I define existential risks and like the whole like that brilliant people Daniel Schmachtenberger and all these Americans that that love holding forth in this hyper intellectual way and and there's deep insights that I might not even grok and haven't even spent enough time going deeply into that they're sharing and some of this something I mean maybe that's what you're referring to when you said we're somehow outside of these communities, you and I. Huh? I actually react against this hyper intellectual analytical, like as much as another white. Yo, I mean, head. it's it's. I, I just I just think I enjoy learning new cultures, and I'm enjoying learning this one. The 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 words you just used, grok, for example. Yeah. It, it took me a long time to grok what grok meant, if you know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but like I enjoyed just sort of sitting with not knowing that word and you know, allowing a hundred uses of it to give me a lot of data points to, to sort of 
have a cultural way into understanding the meaning of it to grok something it's not understand it's not parse it's not all these things you know it, it's it's something else it's kind of a, kind of a flipping surface kind of appraising of a thing but, but before, a little one <coughs> You can keep the recording going. <laughs> well, so yeah, the, the grok, you know, the grok's a huge thing. And, you know, so, and that's one word, that's one meme within, within an entire and it speaks, culture. It, it, it speaks because culture's made up of so many different cultures. The places where we are speaking and the people who are listening to us, it's, it's just in this, it's kind of at the edges of so many communities and then going into those, you know, it's, 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 it's around that, that intellectual dark web even is, is popping. It's, it's, it's sort of turtle head in there. And, um, you know, uh, you know, the psychedelics community, the, you know, there are so many communities that end up overlapping to here. And, you know, what's really interesting is that when you strip everything away and take away all the uh, divergences, you know, for, for each community, and you know, you look for the commonalities. What's in common to all is a sense that, you know, we need to be designing communities. We need to be, you know, creating communities that have, you know, unique, you know, um, economies, governance structures. Um, designs etc cetera, etc cetera, according to the bioregion where they are yes absolutely. you know and for some of them it's a lifeboat you know for some of them it's like well we need to be testing these things for you know the future armageddons and all this kind of thing so there's a lot of apocalyptic kind of uh rapture ideologies you know around these kind of things and who's going to be here for the thousand years of paradise on earth and all that kind of thing there's all kinds of different stuff, um, you know, and, and it kind of feels a bit like the militias with their compounds and all that kind of thing. But, you know, um, that's what they all seem to have in common. And um, weirdly, that's where we've gone. See, this is precisely where I was going earlier with regard to what I le learned living in an intentional community that was somehow, I mean, they were never really pretending to be entirely self-sufficient and self-reliant anyway. When I got there, they'd just done an ecological footprint that showed that their impact was half that of an average community of that size in the UK. So they somehow managed to reduce their global impact, but they were still living a two-planet instead of a one-planet lifestyle. And right. um, these, this story, which is surging with this resurging that we talked about earlier of back to community and regen villages or proto bees or whatever, is, is this small nucleus of me and my friends creating some yeah. different model. It's like a Bucky fortress. Fuller, Bucky Fuller, it, like it turns into a fortress because the logical conclusion is if you still have the big fat cabbages and Glasgow is hungry and they know there's a place yep. up in, on yep. the Forest Peninsula, that um, Finton Peninsula that still has cabbages. When they show up with their mach machete and say, give us your cabbages, do you invite mm -hmm. them for a meditation? Do you share your cabbages? Or um, what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and in so, the end, you, you, you need a lot of them syndicated and interdependent with. Well, this is a but, lot of flows, a lot is, of flows between. It's, uh, yeah, oh, or, or let, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, let, let me quickly it. finish this one because it's a little bit longer. Uh, um, basically, I see this back to the local, back to self sufficiency as a pendulum swing that is the reaction against the neoliberal globalization bullshit. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's not working. We're seeing that. And so everybody's going, oh, yeah, let's localize. That's and really and even good friends of mine, mentors of mine, Ellen and Norbeck Hodge, World Localization Day, all of that has that yeah. energy of ultra local. But we're all talking to each other on computers. We all love lots of technologies that will just not exist if we actually went into these like place based, a few square kilometers. This is our acre, acreage where we grow mm. our 
food and live happily ever after. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. And what it needs is a nuanced conversation between can we maintain a globally collaborative structure that shows true solidarity with other people elsewhere who have a harder time of building a regenerative bioregional economy. At the same time as focusing on building these bioregional places where it precisely because they're not small communities, but because they're territories, real natural landscapes, they include all our diversity. And can we create ways of maybe restructuring our society in such a way that, 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 that they allow for that diversity and that we actually, just as you were, like on the one hand, part of me was like, whoa, did you just say fa fascists? And then he said, I make friends in these communities and I actually see they're nice people. And there's like this part of me, how can you? And, and then there's oh, like- only the crypto, oh, only the crypto fascists. Yeah, but, but on the other <laughs> hand, the, the reality is there are good people, but at least in the crypto fascist um, community, maybe. Um, but I mean, I've been called an eco-fascist by people who are- Eco-fascist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Which I found fascinating. Yeah? Mm. But it's, it's this like trying to impose one ideology mm. on everyone. And so, this kind of bioregional future, how would it look if we, if it, like, can we find the higher ground of understanding that our survival and the, the future of life on earth and definitely of our species depends upon us finding this new pattern of fitting back into life's regenerative patterns by which life has created conditions conducive to life for millions of years, 3.8 billion years. Um, and at the same time, understand our own diversity because we finally grow that we're not separate, we are nature, we're just expressions of this nested complexity, whatever you want to call it. Um, that we then see our own diversity, including our diversity of opinions as part of the creative process by which life explores novelty and hold it, but without not agreeing on this baseline of saying, basically, if you piss on the land you depend on, no, actually, that's a bad metaphor because that's mm. a good thing because of the nitrogen cycle. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but I mean, if you if you don't appreciate- Don't hug a tree, you piss on a tree. Exactly, that's, yeah. that's why but, I say that. Mm. But, but yeah, basically, if you if you cut down the tree instead of eat the apples um, and, and maintain the tree, um, um, that's really what we need to learn in all our diversity. And, and what I'm like in this whole conversation of let's talk about intentional communities. It is this, yeah, let's be realistic about it. We, we, we'll never agree. Mm. We'll always, always disagree. And we'll, but can we find a way to live the questions together rather than fight mm. to death about whose answer is right and whose solution is right to just hold enough doubt and embrace uncertainty to the point that we understand nobody can say if it's too late or if there's still a chance. Either body, anybody who tries to scientifically prove one or the other is captured in their own narrative and their own. Oh, yeah. If people could stop getting trapped by the framing of beginnings and ends. Um, you know, I mean, we all, it always comes up the other, oh, when did all this start? When did it begin? You know, what was the inflection point? <laughs> it's like, well, there were a million inflection points for where all this started, you know, and there's none of them you could have changed to make it go another way. You know, no single one of them or not even a dozen of them. You know, there aren't leverage points in history that where you yeah. could have done something different I mean, and also, gone the, the same way. There wasn't, there, there's not a particular point where the phase shift, like this phase A here and then phase B happening there. So the epoch you mentioned before, the idea of epoch B and all that sort of thing. I think, I think the idea of uh, some people starting to call that game B is more about trying to give it a sense of agency. Like this idea that an epoch is something that's going to happen because it's destined. It's just something that happens in the cycles of the universe. You have these epochs that come around and it's inevitable that everyone's going to go this way in this epoch. Game B, I think it kind of brings in that term 
also weird and, and often unhelpful game theory article sort of th- side of things, you know, <laughs> uh, the game theory side of things whereby, you know, there are certain in- inevitabilities towards, you know, people can't be trusted. So you have to build systems <laughs> that eradicate trust or, you know, that, that enforce trust, um, et cetera. Uh, to sort of try and give people agency or a sense of control. And I think this is where, you know, um, some of your deplorables sort of come sniffing around. They have this sense that there is something, uh, you know, there's something, there's something in all this that's, you know, that's going to uh, resolve the issues of their compound where all the poor poors keep dying and, uh, and the dogs keep biting the children and every now and then somebody somebody goes nuts with their AR and bloody you know, takes out a bunch of the breeding females, etc. So, you know, they like to sort that out. And also, I mean, of course, you billionaires with their, as Rushkoff made famous with the, um, uh, the underground bunkers in New Zealand, <laughs> you know, who want to actually solve the problem of how do I keep my private army loyal? you know, protecting the entrance to my bunker after I destroy everything on the surface. Uh, how do I keep them loyal so that they don't just crack open the bunker, come down, kill me and drink all my brandy? Yeah. You know, it's it's a very limiting, <laughs> limited frame um, for, you know, why, you know, yeah. But, but there's not much difference, really. No, there's uh, a collective between, version. Between the extremely privileged and the extremely underprivileged in, in what kind of uh, end times intentional communities they want to create, what kind of information they're after. And um, I don't know, sometimes I find it distressing that they think they're going to find that in um, in Indigenous knowledge or, or indeed in, in, in uh, the things that you're saying and the work that you're doing. Because yeah. they dare. I mean, there's... A collective version of what you're describing with, in, with New Zealand of of a whole area um, up in upstate New York, um, looking into how can we just like this is a peninsula, great, we can control this bridge, and then um, <laughs> we, we put our collective millions yeah. and millions to defending this region of our. <laughs> Collective retreat, yeah. but it's all of that is 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 a expression of, on the other hand, more and more people waking up that that something's like something's up. The the system they've grown used to it doesn't have the permanence that they expected. Um, but how do we, and can we? Probably we can't affect. The conversation that we still have a window of opportunity in which we could redeploy all forms of human resource, not just money, but the capacity of all of us to create a kind of dual pathway which embraces not knowing, which is healing the mess we've caused by paying attention to healing the ecosystems we're in and the rivers and seas we border on, which we can do in a way that also creates community resilience and capacity to weather cataclysms and and, and the upheaval of the coming decades. Mm. And if we are unlucky or if we can't, like unlucky from the, beginning and end story narrative, yeah? um, there might be an end to our species. But if we walk that pathway, that end will be slightly more humane and there will be a capacity to love each other and love the world and love being alive for a number of generations. And possibly in the, in the understanding of we are our members of a dying species, there could be the generation of deep insights and significance for all of us. And the other path is that through exactly the same actions, we could do part of that learning, part of that deepening of our understanding, our significance and being, and get through the eye of the needle, restructure our presence 
on earth in such a way that we become healers of our communities, of each other and of the landscape. And maybe that's completely and utterly, like the, the, I'm sure some of the communities you mentioned would find, find that idealistic. Well, look, who, who wants to be a long lived species? It just means that you end up being something that's hideously ugly to future species. You know, like that fossil fish, that one that's still going after a billion years or something. You know that one, I can't remember its scientific name, but you look at it and it's just like, oh, yeah, that's disgusting. My it's daughter is kind of, it my freaks daughter, me out. Yeah, my daughter is currently obsessed with dinosaurs. I wouldn't even eat that thing. Like, get like, it away from me. <laughs> she's she's four and a half years old and she's got this book about um, dinosaurs. And, and, mm. and some of them, like the, there's one called Dionicus. It looks like an oversized, like one and a half person-sized chicken with really mm. big claws. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. But it lived nice. it lived a lot longer than our species did. Uh, yeah, so yeah. in evolutionary yeah. terms, adaptive blah 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 conversation, it's actually a very oh. successful being. Uh, like the at, a, at a million of- years, at a million years you're still a young species. Yeah. You know, at a million years as a as a young species. So you you want to get, I mean, you know, you got to at least get your, your um, tele telegram from the queen. <laughs> no, don't just want to get like you know the text from Prince Andrew. You want to go all the way and get the telegram from the Queen. Like get to your million. Um, but we, yeah. But coming back to this, 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 this bit that we're circling around. This, um, yes, we need to strengthen and build community with each other and with life, and mm. it needs to be nested. It needs to understand the entire, it needs to understand like in, in regenesis language, mm. it needs to understand that place is fractal, that it's your locality, yeah. your bioregion, your, I mean, that might be a historical thing that not forever, your nation, yeah. and, and, and then the planet. Yeah? And, and that we need to find the right pattern of weaving these layers together. And the only way that to do any, problem solving at the planetary scale, climate change, inequality, um, obscene economic inequality, wh- whatever you want to call it. Yeah? These problems, the, the longer we stay in the abstract conversation around these problems and then find solutions that we impose on every culture, the more we exasperate them. But if we work on them in community and in bioregional context, we can heal places our communities, and in in that process, we structurally heal the planet, but n- not by big grand roadmaps, blueprints, and save the planet mm-hmm. schemes, but by deeply rooted, sensitive to history, culture, place, potential of place, yeah. potential yeah. of people in place, stories that will probably have a very similar pattern that they will be mm-hmm. regenerative and fit into life's mm-hmm. pattern mm-hmm. of healing the planet and creating shared abundance, but they'll be completely different in each one of those places. Mm. And how do we create the necessarily conversation between these, mm. appreciation of these as part of a larger living body mm. rather than- And how, how, do you, how do you create the super computation of, of the kind of supra rational reasoning that's, that's required you know, to be able to understand um, you know, collective design together as you move forward you know, in those ways where predictive modeling becomes uh, really difficult. And, and I guess, I mean, last night I was talking to a, also a friend of mine, um, Andile, and he was, he was talking about the snake totem of his clan. And, um, and it was the same with all the different animal totems of all the other clans around. But that snake totem that, that follows them, so it's an entity that is grounded in a place but through the diaspora of his community being displaced, that snake totem has followed them. And, you know, if, um, so he's in South Africa now, and if Jeff Bezos, who built his fortune from that emerald mine in South Africa, you know, that he inherited, you know, if he was ever to, uh, if he actually succeeds in colonizing Mars and he ends up sending, you know, um, Andalus clan, uh, up up to Mars to to do the mining up there, or whatever that snake totem will follow them there, and he was telling me about that 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 snake totem how it works through their dreams, and 
you know, it chooses people. It, it gives everybody their roles. It talk, it tells them in their dreams, you know, uh, things that have to go on. And when people have a snake dream, they have to let everyone else in the clan know. And everyone comes together and they sing it and they dance it and they collectively connect, you know, in that psychotechnology of the ritual and the connecting through that one. And they, um, you know, and they collectively compute the information that they're all bringing to the table and they collectively, you know, make decisions about the directions of their culture, their clan, their, their community in that way, in the place where they are. And I think that's exciting. And I think a lot of the Afro, Afro rhythms, if you like, as opposed to algorithms, a lot of the really exciting, you know, uh, Afro technologies that have come out of that continent in the diaspora, when you see how they've landed and, um, and adapted in places like Haiti and Brazil, you know, it's you can see that continuity there. Mm. And you can see those place-based entities that have followed people and then connected with the new place and made entity with the embassy with the entities of that new place. It's very, very interesting and very, very cool. And it's really important, I think, and, and let's take it home here in the last half hour. I think it's really important where you're entering an age where there will be a lot of refugee, what people currently call refugee sort of processes. There will be a lot of displacement, a lot of movement of peoples. Yes, through some pretty horrendous geopolitical stuff that's coming up, but also through you know uh, climate change kind of inspired disasters, um, you know, including famines and you know and knee-jerk reactions, mm, conflicts, sanctions, all these things that are going to arise from that and from scarcities, et cetera, et cetera, as well as your massive weather disasters that are going to occur in this time. There is going to be a lot of movement. There's going to be a lot of upheaval. There'll be a lot of, uh, you know, refugeeism going on. Uh, people are going to have to adapt. People are going to have to be mobile. Um, people are going to have to find ways to keep their knowledge and to maintain continuity with their, um, their practice, their ancestral way, their cultural way, their ethnic ways, the gifts that they have uh, of their language, of their culture. Everyone's going to have to find this. Uh, people are going to have to find ways to hybridize, interact, make embassy, uh, change, adapt, around the place uh, in pretty much the same way that the Jews have been forced to do for um, a couple of millennia um, and, and done quite successfully. Uh, I think this is going to be really important. Um, what are your thoughts on that before I, 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 I propose this idea to you? Kids are coming in, no? I oh, know. Um, but I think that what you just said has, at first I, I the, the sharing about the snake totem was really important because it I, I almost got triggered by before you started with that by the framing of the language of we need powerful computing power to do this analysis of this complexity it, it, and all of that because that's part part like yes and like yes it's useful to have wet weather satellites and understand the dynamics of climate change and and what's coming and all of that and and used wisely some of that technology can be helpful and to frame it in that way uh, even the you to use the the, the meme computing um it, 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 we're much more powerful than just that analytical data crunching algorithm i loved Af Afrorhythms, never heard of that. And it's deep, it's a powerful meme because it's a healing meme that says, actually the sacred technologies come out of Africa because we come out of Africa. And and, and, and the, the guy who did the voice for Jar Jar Binks in the Star Wars movies told me that. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's, a, it's a great word. And, and, but then you spoke with a, with a real example from original culture of, of an example of that. And for me, I, I make sense of it using from like Stefan Harding first introduced me to Jung's like he's, he's the deep ecologist at Schumacher College, and um, Jung has this mandala which is basically the the circle with the four quadrants that is is ancient, uh, um, and he uses it to speak of 
the four ways of knowing, thinking, feeling, sensing, and intuiting. And I, I find that what we've built is a technological culture that is entirely based on thinking and analytical data crunching and the power of technology. And, and, and it's making us not understand that even the scientific insights that led to that technology were nourished by visions, by intuitions, by um, dreams. Um, so they, they included sensing, feeling, and intuiting, but the narrative of science didn't allow that conversation. So only in the biographies or late letters of famous scientists, you can find how their big analytical great breakthrough actually came from a dream of a snake biting its tail. And suddenly the porphyrin ring um, of modern chemistry was, was understood. Uh -huh. And um, it's, it's precisely that. How do we understand that it's that Afro-rhythms are not primitive ancient culture and oh, anybody talking about them is some backward looking guy who just tells us we well, need to go back like the indigenous people used to live in. And it, it, I mean, even the, and this is something that I would love to, to hear your perspective on because I'm, I'm, I just need a little affirmation, I guess, or a mirror. I'm worried that the conversation between indigenous and non-indigenous is well-meaning in the sense of healing trauma and past injustices that have been inflicted upon what, what is called indigenous people over far too long. And it has the potential of creating a, another schism because we're not finding the higher ground of understanding that we're all indigenous to life and that there's not a single indigenous wisdom tradition on the planet where the, the, the true wisdom holder of that tradition could, could, could say, no, we're not indigenous. I think, I think I've resolved that. Mm -hmm. I think I found a way to resolve that in the first uh, chapter of my next book. Okay. I haven't finished the entire book yet. I'm just on the last chapters now. But I think I've resolved that. I, I asked the reader to imagine um, uh, Hobbes and Rousseau um, awkwardly but enthusiastically having sex with each other. And it kind of just sorts it all out. I don't know, it works for me anyway. Because <laughs> you've got the Hobbesian, you know, the primitive horrendous savage, and, and then you've got the Rousseau noble savage. And I don't know. I don't think you should get them to fight. I think they should, um, yeah, they, 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 they should like, they should figure it out with uh, some mad, passionate sex by the campfire. And then, uh, you know, if you can force your brain to work its way through that, then, then you've got the whole thing sorted out. <laughs> because what happens is you're you either mean? so, so disgusted or <laughs> so amused to, that by the end of it, it doesn't matter anymore. Because it's, I don't know, I, I tried to put that in there as a, to derail the grooves mm. of, of, of just this, I'm so sick of yeah. doing the debate. Well, I'm, I'm, so debate. I, I'm so sick of that being the binary that's been placed there for Absolutely. us. Absolutely. We have to choose a position along it. Not, not down for it anymore. So those two, uh, I, and I started the scene weirdly with them both dressed like Winnie the Pooh naked from the waist down. Um, it's just to further like discombobulate people. And then they're like awkwardly kissing and just sort of crying because they don't quite know what's going on. And then, and then they're just like going for it by the fire. Anyway, after I did that, I imagine anyway, either um, no one's going to read that book <laughs> and I'm going to get canceled or people are going to read that book and that's going to be finished. Anyway, I'm rolling the dice. But that's not what I want to run by you. <laughs> Yeah, but, by, you, but you were good. I want to run by something that I think is unique um, and I hope is unique, but okay. you're going to be the one who's going to be able to tell me, uh, you know, the things that we need to look out for. So we have at Deakin, we've started this uh, Indigenous, Deakin University, we've started at the Indigenous Knowledge Systems Lab, and we have a lot of different strands of um, inquiry, but but mostly what we're doing is applying indigenous complexity lens to the problems of the world. Mm -hmm. Trying to find solutions to those problems using indigenous methods of inquiry. Uh, and we have a number of different areas that we're exploring, governance, economics, trade, um, 
finance, cybernetics, you know, a, you know, a thousand different areas. Of course, um, you know, regenerative uh, practices, land management, uh, all of these sorts of things. But basically, we're really interested in the systems that will make those things possible because we believe people already have those regenerative practices patterned in them uh, as a species. Human beings have that. We, we know our ecological niche. We know as a custodial species, what we're supposed to do once we're released back into the ocean or <laughs> wherever it is you come from. So anyway, um, looking at all this and looking at all our various different bits of research from I don't know, memorization techniques to all kinds of things, uh, where it led us all and a way that we could see it all coming together and purposefully into what will be needed most over the next, because we have a deep time focus, what will be needed most over the next five centuries or so. This leads us to a project, which is essentially what might be seen as an intentional community project. Um, but what we're looking at, so one of the issues we're looking at, another thing we're studying is homelessness, which we've reframed, uh, homelessness and refugee you know, crises, etc. We reframe these things not as homelessness, but as landlessness. And um, yeah, so because we know that if you give people a home, you're saddling them with a problem. This big obsolescent thing that that requires pretty much at least one person working full time just to stop the thing from falling down. <laughs> Every week. I mean, it's it's hard. I'm living, I'm living. It's hard. Most yeah. homeless people, if you go, here's a home, uh, within a couple of weeks, they'll be like, oh, fuck this. I'm sleeping rough again when they go. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, yeah. So there's a lot of things we're looking at. But we're coming from a community that is, has been called nomadic for so long. You know, this idea that we're wandering savages, just wandering aimlessly around a, a continent eating you know, snakes and lizards and just sleeping where we fall, um, that we kind of resist that. And we've kind of gone a long way the other way into a kind of a, no, 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 we're this sedentary culture. We're that one tribe, that's our, our place right there. And we, our village, and we never move out of that and we keep it, and, you know, we've got these borders, everyone else stay out. You know, that's our native title of water and I hate you and everybody else is nothing. Um, so, you know, we've kind of gone more that way into that, which is also incorrect. But, you know, what we all know and what's in our law and in our stories is that we're kind of itinerant populations within seasonal estates. So we have these bioregions, you know, that, that, that have these kind of entities. And there's a, every bioregion is an entity that has its own language, has its own spirit, has its own story. And those are the places that we care for as language groups as tribes, if you like, or whatever, and that we move around those large estates seasonally. There's, there's yeah. a map of Living in different Australia. places. There's a map of Exactly. A beautiful map. There's a map of Australia that, yeah, with all the different, you see all the different colored, like a mosaic pattern. Well, if you imagine within each of those, and, and always a strange shape, all of these things, that they're not uniform yeah. or anything like that. These obviously haven't been, they're not geopolitical boundaries. It looks like no other boundaries that you've seen on the planet. You know, because it's kind of like these these little systems of bioregions or clusters of bioregions or, you know, and not just like, oh, this is swamp country. So that's these people. No, no, no. It's, it'll be a swamp and a grassland and a ridge. You know what I mean? It, it'll be a combination of something that is a, a bioregion that's distinct but has different areas in it. And you move around. You have up between six and eight seasons in all these places in Australia, and you move around that estate seasonally so that you've got accessing different areas of that estate uh, for different foods that are in their peak condition. So peak animal fat or, you know, uh, peak ripeness or peak, you know what I mean? This is flowering, this is fruiting, this is medicinal at this time, etc. And you move around to maximize that. And you fit within that uh, symbiotically in that bioregion that develops over thousands of years. In so there's that idea that that you have a mobile thing going on so that you're moving every couple of months. You know, within that estate, you have different camps there. And they're kind of permanent permanent campsites, but you move. 
between them and you rebuild the village each time when you get there. Anyway, we're proposing a model like that. A model like that uh, for uh, intentional communities that so that is quite a large area of land with a village that is mobile within the seasons of that particular landscape and the flows of that landscape. And it's more the landscape itself that's designed out to facilitate seasonal microeconomies out of the affordances of the landscape. But also there's some kind of basic infrastructure in each camp. But the dwellings are designed in a way that, that, um, that they can be moved. Uh, at a pinch, they could be moved by two strong fellas, <laughs> if need be. Um, so that a the entire village can be moved um and and you know hopefully one day without a bunch of flatbed trucks or bloody suzuki's towing towing the tiny homes or whatever um you know it could be moved by a large megafauna <laughs> sort of species dragging them along or a couple of uh, strong men um dragging them along but basically you can move the village to somewhere else on the estate seasonally so that you keep going in a cycle there where you're doing different things. You're burning off the land uh, in another part of the estate while you're living on this part over here and you're caring for it in that way. So the thing is with a lot of our Aboriginal communities, particularly up north, we're very itinerant, you know, communities. So we'll move around. So, you know, in, in my clan, in my family, we move around between Pomp Brow, Kawinyama, Cowan, you know, Elko Island, Groot Island, like we'll move around, Mornington Island. You know, we've always got family in these places and we'll move around all them, even though our homeland's in a really specific place. You know, so yes, we stay in the village that's sort of central, but we also, we're constantly moving around all these other communities. And, you know, most Aboriginal communities in Australia are like this as well, quite itinerant uh, in terms, but within a region, moving around within that region and interacting with communities outside of that region, having, you know, relationships, adoptive relations, et cetera, you know, uh, across those communities. We do that. So we're quite itinerant. We also have uh, quite a lot of homeless people, you know, people who come in and out of homelessness and sleeping rough uh, in our Aboriginal communities. Um, and in Australia, we also have a growing homeless problem just with everybody from all cultures. We also have a, a big problem with, um, you know, refugees settling in and all the, the, all the, all the problems that are attendant with that. Um, a lot of migrant communities that are really struggling and doing it tough as well. So we figured this would be a good community, like uh, refugee communities who are used to having strategies, you know, uh, for living in ways that are mobile. Um, you know, itinerant communities who, who have these skills and cultures already, uh, homeless people who have these, you know, also have these, these, these affordances built into their current lifestyle. Um, you know, we wanted to start with those communities in developing these kind of uh, seasonal estate, you know, mobile communities that are re-embedding themselves in the ecological niche of the landscape. So the idea is instead of setting aside these big swathes of land to turn into wilderness or to replant and regenerate and leave as wilderness areas to visit from time to time, that instead of, you know, regrowing the nature, that we're regrowing the people into the nature, that we're returning people to their ecological niche. We're embedding humans back into the nature, um, to the land that's missing us and that needs us in order to function correctly. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of where we're going with it. We're looking at evolving that over time. And, uh, yeah, in the next five years, uh, getting that started, we're, we're currently, yeah, we're, we're currently uh, tracking down $5 million to, to set that up over five years and then to run it and study it over another five years after that. It's all fives, five research fellows, five postgrad students. <laughs> we're, keeping, we're keeping it simple. We're keeping five five slides in the slide deck. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's that's where we're going with it. We're, we're, we're looking at doing a, a seasonal estate with an itinerant community, a mobile village with especially designed houses 
you know, that are mobile and can be moved, which I think most communities, we can't have these large sedentary cities, large sedentary communities anymore where the infrastructure is permanent because, you know, sea levels rise, tornadoes come, volcanoes go off, bloody asteroids hit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And especially with climate change, uh, people are going to have to learn eventually. And I'm talking over deep time, centuries, you know, people are going to have to learn again how to be mobile. And um, yeah, we wanted to start the, the ball rolling on that at the same time as uh, regenerating landscapes and having the people who are caring for landscapes actually living within them, but being mobile so that they weren't leaving a permanent footprint in any particular place as well. So. First, the question. The consult. I, uh, the question is, I understand that nomadic cultural patterns within a given bioregion mm. um, have supported precisely the ecological process of not overly disturbing one particular area constantly, but using the human role as gardeners in some form of disturbance, some form of harvest, some form of mm. toward the landscape. Exactly at exactly the right time in those eight seasons, that when mm -hmm. you move on to the next one, that particular place doesn't just get a reprieve from the evil human, but has actually been creatively disrupted yes. in a way that it can be more abundant. Yes. And then you move on to the next and the next and the next. And, and the particular that activity that you have to do in that place. So, so, so to, the, to catch the catfish, you have yeah. to burn the grass, you know, the, which... The which, reason why Cook couldn't see an agricultural system when he arrived the seeds, in, which etc. Yeah. The, the reason why Cook couldn't see an agricultural system when he arrived in England uh, in, in in Australia was that his vision of an agricultural system was a completely primitive one, really primitive one, which mm -hmm. is the one based on a plow and over extraction of a particular piece of yeah. land. And the agricultural system he encountered was a highly developed over hundreds of thousands of years. Um, syntropic agroforestry, disturbing mm. the land at the right time and through that disturbance, creating more photosynthetic activity, more mm. productivity and overall a healthier system. I, and, and th but this is precisely the tension in, in, in our current situation that in this conversation about capturing indigenous knowledge and, and regenerative practices in the context of an 8 billion people planet. And of course you can say, yeah, we're doing a deep time project and what you're describing might be useful to a kind of Mad Max post-apocalyptic world of the 24th century um, or mm. the third or even the 22nd or even the end of this one. But um, it's still, yeah, right now in this transition, like both and, like it's, it's, it is important long-term conversation of how do we keep alive this deeper knowledge of we, mm -hmm. when there's a lot or less of us again, for one reason or another, um, this is a very sensible way of, of interacting with the landscape and, and, and actually doing what our species does yeah. best. And what do we do in that period in between? Because that the, the model you're describing... But it's also to lean into the energy of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Because not only that, but I mean, I, in Australia, I don't know if you have it elsewhere, but there are there is a massive community of retirees who mm -hmm. live in caravans and just travel around. You know, there's also the phenomenon of retirees who find that it's cheaper to get a, like a permanent, to keep paying for tickets on cruise ships until they die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's bizarre. I mean, mobile. I so we, we have all of these mobile communities and itinerant communities uh, kind of springing up all over the place in response to, you know, well, that's, there, there's no other option. Um, so we have this massive community of practice happening in, in multiple ethnicities at all different levels of the economic system and all over the place. So, um, yeah, we thought about leveraging that and leaning into that energy and seeing where it takes us uh, to solve the issues of resolve the issues of you know uh, you know climate refugee uh, homelessness um, you know but regeneration of land as well because you know we're not just regenerating an area of bush but we're you know we regenerating it with 
one of the key species in it, which is humans. I mean, this is what you like, absolutely like the, the kind of rewilding story of we mm. just need to two thirds of the planet, get these evil humans out of it and, and just yeah. give it back to nature. It's it's an overswinging of the pendulum, well-intended people, good people proposing something like this isn't working, let's try that. Yeah. Um, it's it's still in the mental framing of humans being other than nature and humans not yeah. having a biological ecological lineage that proves simply by their existence that we're still alive yeah? that well, you, you've got no idea how many of us are just sick of doing indigenous ranger work yeah. because we have these co-management sort of co-land management projects here we have indigenous ranger work where we have to commute for an hour to get to the place where we're <laughs> where we're you know co-managing the landscape and helping people back burn and bloody you know shoot wild cats and all that kind of thing and then commuting an hour back to where we're actually living um yeah much preferable thank you if we were living in that landscape that we were caring for and moving about it seasonally and doing the things we need to be doing in the seasonal symbioses that we're supposed to be doing them in um yeah so just for a start just from that point of view it's um, that's the way to do things. However, yeah, we think that there's a lot of intersecting points here. Mm. Uh, it'll be worth, yeah, it'd be really worth doing as, as kind of a transitional, you know, community way of being. But how do you envision it? Is it an academic project, or is it actually you're actively engaging with all? It the is. It's it's tying together a lot of different uh, threads of a lot of different research projects. Mm. Um, yeah, a lot of different areas of research and it's tying, together in a, in tying it together in a um, unifying project over a number of years where we can do a couple of test cases um, and see how they go. Um, yeah, which uh, I don't know, it's pretty exciting. One thing that when you were describing it, I was thinking, yes, there, of course, there, there are all these communities that have this transience or, or um, nomadic situation in them. But again, there's this underlying inequality in in this that mm. for example lovely people like for example, the, the number of semi-retired or about to retire professors at the california institute of integral study that have done really mm. a lifetime of teaching of inspiring young minds and good good people who can't afford to retire in the bay area who are moving to mexico or to bolivia or something because their meager pensions Give them a relatively decent life there but but not eh? and and so it's you were you were speaking about this slightly mm. world of retirees with their caravans but they still have the money to buy a caravan and, and yeah tow it around and and so it's like not all just the fact that people are nomadic doesn't mean that they necessarily have that healing deeply placed so no but they have skills place. <laughs> they have survival skills of you know having having to survive an itinerant lifestyle and a um, an economy that des demands sedentarism for a person even to have an identity let alone a, a bank account or anything else you know mm -hmm. it's um yeah so so there are there are skills there and i mean imagine if that uh you know your marginal identity and and um like actually provided you with um with a skill set that suddenly have um, value in a different kind of way of being. It's a little bit, there's a program right now, a really interesting justice program that's, that's grounded in some solid research that's looking at, um, that's looking at indigenous youth and saying, okay, and that has equated it through research, the risk taking behaviors of a lot of uh, uh, indigenous criminals in the justice system, young criminals, especially. It's equated that with uh, the risk-taking behaviours that is necessary for um, uh, doing well in business and being a successful CEO. <laughs> so they're starting a program to um, to use those skills, you know, to create a new generation of indigenous uh, business people, which is a which is a problem. But it's just an example. It's a problem. How, you know, a negative skill set. You know, in, in one sense, can actually you know be generalizable across to something that's helpful in another. I think we're being told by the next generation to wrap it up and have another call some other time. <laughs> so, oops.
Yeah, we, got, we just need another vibe. <laughs> Here we are. One. Okay. Oops, he's still off. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. That was, that was a good first year. I, nice to see you live in a <laughs> nice to see you live in a similar chaos than I live in most of the time. She's just in preschool right now. That, that's why it's so quiet here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the, this boy, he, he's a real handful, uh, to say the least. Yeah, there's not a lot of support in Melbourne for uh, like autistic kids. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, we've been waiting for six months for our first appointment. Um, <laughs> it was the earliest appointment we could get. Just trying to get some kind of assistance, but um, anyway, that's coming up in June, so fingers crossed that that should be good. Within another six months, we should we should have some kind of support. So, yay, the yeah. social safety net. But how, I mean, before before we end, like the, 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 what you spoke of earlier, that the, that you actually somehow choosing, but also somehow by circumstances. In, in the situation that you're not on the land that you actually really feel mm. a deep connection with and, and a kind of, I don't know, do, am I hearing right that, that that ultimately you would like to go back there? It's just right now, this is not the phase of life. Or, yeah, yeah. The, but in, in, in all of this, what we've been talking I've about. Got the, I've got three more years before I can go back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because it's, it's life's, like I, I just increasingly feel like how much longer do I have to sit in front of a computer um, as much as this is like super riching, wonderful conversation that I will cherish. Um, is this like letting go to let come, like even the, 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 the beautiful addiction of having these deeply meaningful conversations with kindred spirits or people working from a similar impulse all over the world. And then realizing that right now to be on land, to be with community, to learn the ancient ways that are forever new because they're out of time. As, as like, I, I, if you haven't read this, like just Google Gary Snyder reinhabitation PDF, and there'll be this, yeah. this, this thing comes up that is his address to a conference that they did in California in 1977 and at the end he the, read the last paragraph as a little little gift mm -hmm. i won't i won't spoil it Sweet. Um, right. but it is it, it's like how, how do we both do our work and also understand that it is nourished from mm. that deeper process of inhabitation and that with any minute we are when we're not doing that but we're communicating about it we're Oh, I, I am, I should talk about me. I feel like I'm starting to run thin. Like, um, I don't know, do, do, do you resonate with that? Oh, completely. Yeah, yeah. No, I, but that's my personal sort of thing. And I, I don't know, I think a lot of groups are feeling that, uh, but they're also sort of thinking that's because there are other groups and, oh my God, I'm tired because these people don't get it. <laughs> and they're, tr they're trying to destroy us and they will never understand and I'm so tired. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think half of it is a manufactured uh, despair, mm. um, you know. But I, I just I feel like it's just there, you know. It's just there if we can figure out a few just little little ways to break the spell of some of these thought terminating memes <laughs> and wrong stories that are in our way. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, we're we're just really keen to just run experiments. Mm you know, in places around sort of, uh, you know, working from our Indigenous law and methods of inquiry, you know, to find, um, you know, emergent and, and unique and useful methods of governance, patterns of governance, uh, systems, you know, um, you know, economies, economic models, uh, you know, uh, ways of doing embassy. Uh, with each other in the nested fractals that you were mentioning earlier. Um, you know, the models, the checks and balances, how you make all that work and balance. Um, yeah, we're really keen to do that out of these kind of live experiments uh, that we'll be running you know, over the next decade mm -hmm. in places all over Australia. But um, 
yeah, but I'll be doing is that it, from up north in, it, in three years. Is it yeah. linked? Is it linked um, to the regenerating the songlines initiative, or completely separate? Ah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, the um, yeah. So one of our senior research fellows, uh, Chelsea Marshall, mm -hmm. is is on the board mm -hmm. uh, with me uh, of of that regenerating songlines, and you know, so we're doing that work with Anne Paulina about traditional law mm -hmm. there and. Uh, yes, about reinstating that, but also about um, situating that within mm. a framework, a legitimate yeah. framework of legal pluralism that's you know currently already in international law and how how all that might work, mm. uh, just wow. as a way of uh, you know coexisting and actually getting it done globally, not just locally. Mm. So. Okay, yeah. so now I get, now I get you. So you're really looking it actually at this that for a time we will coexist in these systems. There will be people in cities and very much on their land and defending. Yeah. Uh, how do we but there, allow there will, there will there will be a transitional? Uh, there'll have to be a, some transitional things when we're when we're reestablishing symbioses. Hmm. This isn't a return to some Captain K manual or anything like that. This is uh, you know. This is a retrieving forward of patterns that work, and yeah. you know, and a um, you know, a survivance beyond that, and a thriving, uh, yeah, vital work. And of course, is where you want to go with it. Yeah. But you know, you can't listen to any single person about that. Yeah. I'm practically an anarcho-communist. You don't want to listen to me, or everything will be blown up. <laughs> Goodness me. Yeah. So that's why we need research. Good research. Yeah, and we need to allow multiple ways of knowing that not ultimately cuts everything down to if you haven't done the analytical research based on yeah. analytical statistically significant data with a p-value, then it doesn't count because that's cut out exactly the voice that we should have listened to for far too long. That's why Blake said, may God us keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. Um, we've been in that Newton's sleep of give me the research, show me the data um, mm. for a long time. And that's the that's the Achilles tendon of, of academia. How do you use it as a kind of uh, Aikido to use the uh, academic, which I think you, you're doing, academic yeah. system and research grants to break that open. But but there's capture. But at the same time, the system. He, he who uh, bends to himself a joy doth the winged life destroy. A bit more Blake. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure this play. I need to let that one sink in a little. Right. All right. What a so, man. I better uh, get back to these babies. Yeah, you get back to these babies and we'll we'll oh, have yeah. a conversation when, when I don't feel post fluey. Uh, but this has been really wonderful. I'll 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 just yeah. once this the recording is downloaded on my computer, I'll just send it to you um via we transfer and All right. you, choose, you choose to so you now we've had our big free range yarn i guess down the track when we thought about it we'll try to keep them to an hour because i mean this long form stuff is you know i i don't have enough supplements and athletic greens and stuff to get me through bloody two or and a half hours yeah. <laughs> of yarn only, only, only you have to keep it to an hour yeah uh, you, you, you know long form is for people who can afford you know good diets and 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 you know, whiskey and, 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 and weed and all, or whatever it is they need to get. <coughs> um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it to an hour next time. <laughs> well, you, oh, you can choose, like, I'm also happy not to, not to share this one and just have a conversation and we do a shorter conversation. Oh, so, look, I, I, anyway. yeah, we can do that if you like, but I'm definitely sharing it. So send me, send okay. me the recording. Okay. <laughs> it's a great one. It was a good, it was a good messy, uh, yeah. it was just, Exactly the kind of thing that uh, we like to put up on our on our on our podcast of messy yarns. Great, wonderful, yeah. so lovely to meet you. And and may may like yeah. On the one hand, we all need to re inhabit our places, but I also dream of futures where I would love to sit in a circle with you rather than yeah yeah on the screen. So yeah, well, let's do that. Yeah, lots of love and have fun with the little ones. Bye. Yeah yeah. Okay. Bye. <laughs>